Hi there art enthusiasts, I'm artist Lillian Gray and today I've got something exciting to share with you. Get ready to meet the vibrant South African artist known as Lady Scully. A word of caution, due to the sexual nature, violence and dark humour of some of these artworks, we have created this video for 16 years and up. We also have a PG video on Lady Scully that you can watch here. Oh, and by the way, I've got some awesome worksheets related to Lady Scully available on my Teachers Pay Teachers store. They're designed for different ages and are loads of fun to do, so make sure to check them out. Lady Scully is a contemporary artist known for her thought-provoking artwork. She is a versatile and multidisciplinary artist, adept at expressing her vision through a diverse range of mediums. Her repertoire includes painting, drawing, printmaking and performance art. She often incorporates elements of sexuality, gender, desire and power dynamics. She loves challenging society's norms and conventions. Her work is easily recognizable, with a fusion of Khoisan drawings combined with vivid intense colors, intricate patterns and bold lines, creating visually striking and engaging compositions. She draws inspiration from her personal experiences, as well as South African history, politics, social issues and her Khoisan heritage. Lady Scully was born in 1987 in Cape Town, South Africa, as Laura Windvogel. Growing up in the new South Africa, in the Cape Coloured community, she was eager to understand what being coloured truly meant. Over the years, she crafted her moniker Lady Scully, her alter ego, a place where femininity and masculinity meets. The name is a complete oxymoron. Lady refers to European conventions, especially the expectations placed on women in British society. Scully is a word used to describe a male person of mixed race in South Africa who is an outcast, an uncouth thief or a thug. She explains that she wants you to think of Lady Scully as that dirty Auntie Scully who says whatever you've been thinking but would never admit to. This combination of Lady and Scully refers to the tension and struggles that shaped the Cape Coloured community in South Africa throughout its history. This video will touch on this complex history so that you can truly understand her art. Buckle up and prepare yourself because I'm about to unveil the top 5 mind-blowing artworks by Lady Scully that you absolutely cannot miss. Artwork number 1. They'll suck you dry. Beware. At first glance, we see an orange woman hunching over with four breasts, a papaya for her head and a broken chain around her neck under a starry night on a barren land. What on earth is going on here? I'm glad you asked. Let me explain. This artwork is about Kurtua. Kurtua was a koi koi girl who suffered at colonialists' hands during the Cape Colony founding. She was the niece of Harry de Strandloper, the beach walker, chief at Chumau, who often traded livestock with the Dutch for various goods. At the mere age of 10, Courtois was sent to go live in the household of Jan van Riebeek, the first governor of the Cape Colony, to train as a translator for the Verenigde Oost Indische Compagnie, VOC. During her teenage years, Kurtua dedicated herself to learning Dutch and Portuguese and began working as an interpreter for the Fiosia. Her linguistic skills allowed her to swiftly establish herself as a shrewd and capable business partner to the Dutch. At the time of her death, Kurtua spoke four European languages fluently. In this role, she occupied a truly exceptional position as she skillfully navigated the cultural divide between the indigenous people and the European colonizers. And she became a woman caught up in a man's world, sitting in council with male officials and military officers. At the height of her career as an interpreter, Kurtua held the belief that the presence of the Dutch could bring mutual benefit to both sides. However, her role as a mediator between her tribe's needs and the expansion of the colony placed her in a constant state of conflict. Nevertheless, she emerged as a highly valued peace negotiator during the times of war. Kurtua personifies the genuine state of being suspended between two cultures, moving back and forth between the fort and the native kraal. Tragically, Kurtua became a pawn in this male-dominated world. At first, she was under the protection of Governor Jan van Riebeek. The circumstances surrounding Kurtua's entrance into Jan van Riebeek's household has been the subject of various accounts. One version suggests that she was forcibly taken as a child, 
although no concrete evidence substantiates this claim. However, she did attempt to run away on multiple occasions, but was always found and brought back to the fort. It could also be that Kretua was a pawn in one of her uncle's treaty deals with the Dutch. It is possible that she joined as a companion to Jan van Riebeek's children, or as a servant to his wife. Kretua was never completely clothed like a European, but rather wore clothes usually assigned to slaves. A symbol of being accepted in the social society of the Dutch Fiosia was baptism. She was only baptized three days before Jan van Riebeck left the Cape and was given her new Christian name, Eva. The late baptism indicates that she was never truly a part of Jan van Riebeck's nuclear family, as some people believe. Several authors and historians speculate that her living conditions likely involved sexual abuse, based on the affectionate tone Jan van Riebeck displayed towards her in his journals. Jan van Riebeck mentions Kretua's name 200 times in 65 entries in his journal. There has been speculations that Jan van Riebeck raped Kretua, but there is no definite proof of such events. The problem with interpreting Kretua's history is that we only have written accounts by the perpetrator and not the victim. Together with this evidence, we can study the zeitgeist and then only speculate what life was like for Kutua. The establishment of colonies came with a certain culture of violence. The colonial society practiced slavery. They bought and sold people. In her article titled, Was Iefa, Kutua, Raped? An Exercise in Speculative History, Yvette Abrams argues that slavery and rape were commonly employed tools at exerting dominance during colonialism. You see, Kretua birthed her first child at the mere age of 15, when she was still under Jan van Riebeck's protection. There is much speculation as to who the father of this first child was. The fear was seer blamed it on a French lieutenant passing through on his travels and tried to cover it up. Later, at the age of 17, Kretua birthed her second child in the fort. Now, this could indicate abuse as a female teenager in this overwhelming male environment, or it could suggest a secret love. Moreover, Abrams demonstrates how Kretua exhibited several signs of rape trauma syndrome later in her life. Various heritage activists support the belief that Kretua endured abuse and rape, possibly at the hands of multiple Dutch officials and does not discount the possibility of Van Riebeck's involvement in these acts. Once Van Riebeck left the Cape, the new governor had no use for Couture, since the colony was firmly established by then. She lost her protected status. Couture, now known as Eva, married Pieter van Meerhof, and her name was officially changed to Eva van Meerhof. She was the first Kwekwe to be baptized and receive a Christian marriage. To the Dutch, she was seen as a cultural bridge between the indigenous Khoikhoi and the Europeans. But this created conflict within her own tribe and was met with disapproval. Unfortunately, Kretua's husband was murdered on an expedition and she was left with her three children. She has now lost her male protection once again and her life took a tragic turn. Iafa spiraled into alcoholism and chose to leave the fort seeking refuge in the native Kwekwe kraal. As time passed, her relationship with both the Dutch and the Kwekwe became so strained that she became an outsider in both societies. Regrettably, she was imprisoned for immoral behavior and banished to Robben Island. Tragically, Kretua lost custody of her children. This woman, with a brilliant mind and an aptitude for languages and politics, is said to fall into prostitution. Kretua eventually dies at the mere age of 31, drinking herself to death. By this time, she had birthed eight children in total, of whom three died in infancy. In retrospect, her Dutch name, Eva, meaning first woman, ironically encapsulates her experience under colonialism, which was shared by countless Khoisan women throughout history. Kretua has become a symbol of resilience, cultural hybridity, and a struggle for identity in the context of South Africa's colonial past. Now that you know the story, let's delve into the analysis of Lady Scully's artwork. It is evident that the drawing style draws inspiration from the Khoisan rock paintings, characterized by elongated arms, a side view perspective, a prominent buttocks and exposed breasts. The vibrant orange hue also recalls iron-rich pigments utilized by the Khoisan. 
including a papaya head accompanied by four breasts, symbolizes fertility and pays homage to Krutua's significant role as a mother figure of the nation. Following Krutua's banishment, Jan van Riebeek's niece, Elizabeth van Oudorp, adopted some of Krutua's children. The youngest daughter, Pieternella van Meerhof, became known as Pieternella van Ikop. She entered into a marriage with a Fiatwasia farmer, and together they had four sons and four daughters. Krutua's descendants include prominent Afrikaner families. The depiction of an empty womb could represent Krutua's anguish and loss over the separation from her children. It is worth noting that the acknowledgement of Krutua's descendants and their integration into Afrikaner lineage was met with vehement denial by white South Africans in the past. You see, during the era of apartheid that was characterized by white supremacy, this recognition conflicted with the prevailing ideology. Krutua is also seen as the mother of the Afrikaans language. She was one of the first people to speak both the Khoikhoi language and Dutch. Today, various Khoikhoi words are officially adopted into the Afrikaans dictionary. Lady Scorley aims to draw our attention to the suffering and struggles of her Khoisan ancestors. Caught in the midst of two contrasting cultures during a turbulent era of colonialization. You see, Lady Scully herself has experienced the sense of being caught between two cultures. Born in 1987, she witnessed a pivotal period of change as the resistance against apartheid grew stronger. In 1991, the doors of the white schools opened to children of all races. Lady Scully, a colored girl raised in the Cape Flats, had the opportunity to attend a prestigious white school. Reflecting on this experience, she remarks, we go to white schools and try to assimilate to whiteness, resulting from apartheid, but can't assimilate too much. Your success has limits. So my Princess Kratua wears a collar, but it's broken. The modern representation of Kratua shows the breaking of her shackles, signifying a newfound freedom. Both the chains and the moon are depicted using crumpled gold leaf, intricately connecting them. In the Khoisan religion, the moon holds particular significance as a deity embodying the remarkable power of resurrection, undergoing rebirth every 29 days. By visibly intertwining the chain with the moon, it symbolizes the Khoisan god, breaking Krutua's shackles, liberating her and facilitating a rebirth of her spirit. However, she must now navigate her way and shape a new future for herself. The artwork also serves as a commentary on how women's sexuality has historically been objectified, desired and exploited by men. The moon takes on the appearance of a yawny shape, possibly alluding to new deceptive promises that may ultimately lead to fresh forms of confinement. It serves as a cautionary reminder to all women to remain vigilant against the power dynamics imposed by men. Also encrusted with gold leaf is a halo around the papaya's head. The halo is a symbol of holiness and re-establishes Kutua as a martyr and a saint. Artwork number two, Koi Sun Queen Mother. In 2019, Lady Scully painted this mural, especially for an exhibition in London. It envisions a Koi Sun Queen, arms raised to the sky, smiling, while Khoisan ancestors dance inside her halo. She is wearing a slave collar with no chain attached, rocking a banana skirt and a bright red manicure. Oh my goodness, so much is going on in this artwork, but let's start by picking apart some of the symbols. A banana skirt? What is up with that? Travel back in time to the summer of 1926 in Paris. Picture this, a bustling theatre, filled with eager Parisians awaiting the start of La Revue Nigre, a jazz-infused musical extravaganza. Suddenly, from atop of a palm tree, Josephine Baker emerges in her iconic outfit. A skirt made out of 16 rubber bananas, accompanied by pearl strings and wrist cuffs. As she began to dance, the atmosphere crackled with electricity and astonishment. Her performance shattered preconceived notions of race and gender, redefining them through style and artistry. Throughout history, the black female form in Europe has been burdened with damaging stereotypes, portraying black women as sexual deviant, primitive and hypersexual. 
a spectacle subjected to the perverse white male gaze. This dance, the dance of the savage, propelled Baker to become the world's biggest black female star overnight. The impact was immense. Banana skirt clad dolls flew off the shelves and Baker devoted fans sought to emulate her look by purchasing Baker Skin, a skin darkening lotion, and Baker Fix, a hair gel. Postcards featuring Baker in her famous banana skirt circulated widely. By reclaiming her image, Baker defied societal expectations and forged a groundbreaking career for herself. A feat unheard of for women in that era. Even as her banana skirt evolved into fierce spiked versions in later years, the initial design remains revolutionary. Beyonce paid tribute to Baker by donning a banana skirt during her 2006 Fashion Rocks performance. Rihanna made a memorable statement at the 2014 Fashion Awards wearing a sheer Baker-inspired dress. In this vibrant mural, Lady Scully pays homage to Baker by depicting her koi sun queen wearing the iconic banana skirt. It becomes a powerful commentary on the over-sexualization of the black female body. Let's zoom in to the collar worn by the queen. It symbolizes the profound impact of colonialism and the slave trade on the indigenous Khoisan people. Although no longer connected to a chain, the queen still wears the collar, representing how the consequences of this destruction persists today as indigenous communities strive to reclaim and revitalize their cultural identities. The title Queen Mother holds significance, particularly as this art exhibition is taking place in London. It alludes to the Queen of England and the monarchy's role in colonialism. Lady Scully explains, I don't think you can talk about the UK and South Africa without talking about colonization and the Khoisan traditions that were destroyed by it. The deliberate spelling of queen serves as a reminder of the limited education often associated with various colored neighborhoods. It refers to the challenges faced in the post-apartheid crime-ridden Cape Flats area. The fact that this is a mural painted on a gallery wall is an ode to Khoisan cave paintings. It's all about claiming the space. This is important because this Khoisan queen references both Sara Bartman and Krutua as influential historical Khoi women who suffered under colonialism. I'm telling you the story of Sara Bartman later in this video, so stay tuned. This artwork is all about rewriting the history. You see, Europeans traveled to South Africa, dispossessing the Khoi Khoi of their land, culture and language, all in the name of colonialism, serving the interests of their kings, countries and empires. Almost 400 years later, Lady Scully, a descendant of the Khoi Khoi, ventures to London to showcase her art, shedding light on the influence of colonialism on her culture and community. She explains, I was on MTV Africa yesterday and they were like, Lady Scully, colonizing London. But it's not about colonization. It's about shoving this in their faces and making them notice. Through the skillful use of repetitive pattern, she infuses rhythm into her art. The queen's entire body is adorned with intricate patterns, paying homage to the significant role that repetition plays within Khoisan culture. In Khoi traditions, the act of repeating the same action is integral to enter a trance state, fostering a profound sense of tranquility and inner peace. However, this queen goes beyond tranquility. With her five long arms outstretched, and the graceful figures of her ancestors swirling around her halo, she exudes an unmistakable aura of power and majesty. There's no question about who holds authority in this space. This queen reigns supreme. Artwork number three, Papsak Propaganda 2. Like the clashing image of the champagne flute tower, pouring into the top, trickling to the bottom. From Lady Scully's exhibition called Papsak Propaganda, this artwork is my personal favorite. In the background of the artwork, we see a settler's ship approaching the Cape, accompanied by a vibrant rainbow overhead. In the foreground, there is a towering settler pouring wine onto a Khoisan woman's face, which trickles down her neck and over her breasts. Beneath her, severed Khoisan heads float in the ocean. Clutched in her hands are bottles of wine, from which she feeds two of the heads as if bottle feeding them. The remaining heads are each mindlessly drinking their own bottle of wine. 
The subtitle of this artwork draws our attention to the chain reaction, likening it to a cascading champagne tower, filling from top to bottom. However, the irony lies in the fact that the heads do not appear to be celebrating. Instead, they appear lifeless and devoid of thought. So who is truly celebrating? According to Lady Scully, this artwork speaks about how the colonists weaponized the Khoisan. It delves into the destructive impact of alcohol on the colored community. The mid-1600s marked the initial encounter between the Dutch settlers and the Khoikhoi, the first indigenous people in the region. The settlers were in dire need of the Khoikhoi's cattle, and they required fresh meat to supply their ships en route to India for spice trading. To compensate the Khoikhoi, the settlers started providing tobacco and wine as payment, cultivating a dependency. As the Dutch expanded their farms, the Khoisan people faced dispossession, extermination and enslavement. Interactions between the Dutch, British settlers, Khoisan and the neighbouring Bantu populations led to a unique mixed race community known as the Cape Coloreds. Enslaved individuals from Malaysia, Indonesia, Madagascar and India were also brought in by the British, further adding to the diverse ancestry of the Cape Colored population. As the Khoisan integrated with the Dutch and became enslaved, they were employed on Western Cape farms, particularly wine farms. And this gave rise to the DOP system, where farm workers received monetary payment along with a daily allowance of cheap wine. The Afrikaans word DOP refers to a shot of an alcoholic drink. This practice contributed to the exasperation of alcoholism among farm workers, resulting in significant social harm within communities, particularly among the Cape Colored community. It trapped them in a cycle of poverty and dependence. Although the DOP system has largely been eradicated today, the legacy remains. Alcoholism continues to be a prevalent issue. The Western Cape faces the highest incidences of fetal alcohol syndrome in the world. And despite receiving cash wages today, many workers still struggle with alcohol misuse. Lady Scully has a personal connection to the issue of alcohol abuse, as her father served as the head of the liquor board of South Africa. She remembers traveling with him to small towns in the Western Cape as a little girl where he would go to educate communities about the dangers of alcohol. He would take two tins and place a bean in each, giving one alcohol and the other water to demonstrate the dangers of drinking during pregnancy. You see, the heavy abuse of alcohol was deeply rooted within the culture, making such awareness efforts crucial. The title of the artwork, Papsak Propaganda, has significant meaning. Papsak refers to a cheap wine sold in liters, commonly consumed by colored farm workers. It's made from overripe, spoiled grapes that are no longer suitable for sale. The second word in the title alludes to the propaganda machine of the apartheid regime. Apartheid ensured political, social and economic dominance by the white minority. Propaganda was employed to maintain white supremacy, controlling the media and shaping a specific image of the Afrikaner folk. As I explained earlier, Lady Scully could attend a white school. Now her experience attending this white school during the end of apartheid exposed her to the lessons, songs and ideas promoted in such institutions. The celebration of Jan van Riebeek as a national hero and the singing of songs in his honor was part of the narrative she encountered. There she was, standing as a colored girl, a descendant of the Khoisan, being asked to thank Jan van Riebeek, to be grateful that her people were almost destroyed by colonialism. It was clear that Lady Scully was on the wrong side of this narrative. For a creative writing assignment at school, the children in the class were asked to write a letter, imagining that they just arrived on a boat sailing into Table Bay in the 1600s. They had to close their eyes and imagine what it would feel like. And as Lady Scully closed her eyes, she would imagine herself as a Khoisan girl standing on the beach, watching the ship approach. She would definitely not be writing a letter to her family back in Europe. Another incident was a class outing when everybody gathered on the bus to go visit the Cape Town Castle. And they all visited the dungeon. And it was a form of amusement for the white students. 
But in that exact dungeon, Khoisan people were imprisoned. So for Lady Scully, this highlighted the trauma that was endured by her ancestors. Reflecting on her childhood experiences, Lady Scully recognizes the power of propaganda in shaping children's perceptions. She realizes now that when faced with propaganda, you can either resist it or just go with the flow. The rainbow in the artwork serves as a sarcastic reference to the modern propaganda employed in the post-apartheid South Africa. It challenges the notion of the rainbow nation and the concept of unity, such as Ubuntu and Simunye, we're all one. Lady Scully argues that we are not all one. Every single tribe within South Africa had a different experience under colonialism and apartheid and should be treated differently. This artwork aims to rewrite narratives, re-evaluate long-held stories, and confront the true struggles faced by South Africa and the factors that have brought the nation to its current state. Artwork number four, Cut, Cut, Kill, Kill, Stab, Stab, a South African love story. Gender-based violence is a deeply rooted and extensive issue in South Africa, impacting almost every aspect of life. South Africa has unprecedented levels of women abuse and violence. The most recent data from the World Health Organization shows that South Africa's femicide rate was almost five times higher than the global average. This systematic problem is deeply ingrained within South African institutions, cultures and traditions. Lady Scully states that it is a political thing to be a woman in South Africa, regardless of race, gender or background. One particular week in August 2019 left a profound impact on the nation. The tragic death of Yuneni, a 19-year-old first-year student, shocked and outraged the South African population. Her disappearance for nine agonizing days spurred a nationwide search with a hashtag BringNene Home. Regrettably, the search concluded when her burnt body was discovered. It was revealed that Yunene had visited the post office to collect a package where she was brutally raped and killed by one of the staff members. This incident ignited the total shutdown protests held across the country, demanding urgent action against gender-based violence. Unfortunately, violence against women often faces a lack of serious attention from local authorities in South Africa. Many officials dismiss and trivialize women's reports of crimes. Fear and apprehension prevent many women from reporting crimes, opting for silence instead. Lady Scully's painting, Cut, Cut, Kill, Kill, Stab, Stab, deals with the gaslighting of women's faces when they're reporting cases of sexual assault to the police. Many of Lady Scully's artworks are vibrant and colorful, often featuring luscious fruits that initially exude a sense of joy and appeal. However, upon closer inspection, reading the titles and grasping the underlying message, it delivers a profound impact striking the viewer like a forceful blow to the gut. Despite their seemingly ordinary nature, fruit possesses the remarkable ability to evoke strong emotions. Lady Scully skillfully employs fruit, such as a sliced pawpaw and apples, as potent metaphors for genitalia. This artistic choice aligns with a long-standing tradition amongst feminist artists who have utilized food imagery to portray the female body as an object subjected to consumption. Furthermore, it clearly references the biblical tale of the forbidden fruit, which led to Adam and Eve's expulsion from the garden. The act of cutting the fruit conveys a sense of violence, adding another layer of meaning to the artwork. Lady Scully explains, Everyone loves to be entertained and not preached at. I think sometimes I don't only wrap provocative elements in sweetness, but also the rot. No one wants to look at rot, but once it has a layer of sweet, we try to ignore that stench of violence. She says it's time for people to feel uncomfortable, for people to ask themselves very hard questions about how they relate to women, how they treat them, how they talk to them. Through her thought-provoking works, she challenges gender roles and encourages viewers to reconsider their beliefs. Combining influences from the ancient Khoisan heritage with contemporary political relevance, her work conveys potent messages about consent, and power dynamics. As a staunch advocate against gender-based violence, she fearlessly raises her voice, using her art as a powerful tool for social change. Artwork number five, the artist's booty print, objectified by eyes and digital media. 
In this artwork, we encounter ink prints of Lady Scully's bum on canvas, a process that must have been super fun to make. Surrounding her buttocks are numerous eyes, some judging while others admire. Many hands are engaged in taking selfies, capturing the moment. Lady Scully often utilizes humor as a means to convey her thought-provoking messages. She explains, I use humor as a way of unwrapping severe issues in a palatable way, so that people will actually start thinking about change. This particular artwork delves into her identity as a Khoisan colored woman in the contemporary world, drawing a parallel to the narrative of Sarah Bartman. Sarah Bartman was also known as Sarki Bartman. She was a Khoikhoi woman who was exploited as a freak show attraction in the 19th century Europe under the deplorable name of the Hottentot Venus. European audiences flocked to see her due to her specific body type, which was considered very unusual in Western Europe. Now, I am sure many of you in South Africa have heard about Sarki, but do you really know the extent of her story? The details are shocking and disturbing. She was promoted as the missing link between man and beast, which sparked a disturbing fascination with her genitalia among the European public. Scientists dissected her body and a museum retained her remains, including her brain, genitalia and skeleton. The timeline of Sarah Bartman's restitution is deeply troubling. She departed for Britain in 1810, passed away in 1815, and her remains were put on display. In 1937, they were transferred to a new museum. And finally, in 1994, Nelson Mandela officially requested her remains to be returned to South Africa. Following extensive debates, her remains were finally returned in 2002, and she was laid to rest in peace. Sarah Bartman has become an icon in South Africa, symbolizing various aspects of the nation's history. Her story epitomizes the racist colonial exploits that occurred, highlighting the commodification and dehumanization of black individuals. Her body became a symbolic representation of all African women, playing a pivotal role in the colonialization of parts of Africa and the shaping of narratives. Travel accounts and imagery depict black women as sexually primitive and savage, perpetuating the belief that Africa would benefit from colonialization by European settlers. Colonizers believed that they were reforming and correcting Khoisan culture in the name of Christianity. Dehumanizing the Khoisan was deemed necessary to strip them of their human rights and establish dominance and supremacy. Lady Scully's representation of Sarah Bartman in various artworks is different from the historical representations. Some of them are considered self-portraits. She explains, My family used to call me Sarki, the diminutive form of Sarah, as a joke. I remember being consumed by a vague feeling of shame. Through portraying herself as Sarah Bartman, Lady Scully directs our attention towards the unrealistic ideals imposed on the female body, particularly the black female body. Historical evidence suggests that Sarah Bartman's features were exaggerated in illustrations to further emphasize her freakish nature and enhance her appeal as an attraction. Even her facial expression was depicted to imply a lack of intelligence. However, it's important to recognize that Sarah Bartman was far from unintelligent. In reality, she was a multilingual individual who spoke three languages fluently. During her trial, she eloquently defended herself in Dutch and was even skilled in playing the harp. Lady Scully's art also underscores the unfortunate truth that unrealistic expectations of the female form have not changed much over the years. The legacy of Bartman has been resurrected recently with renewed attention to issues of body shaming women of color. Reality TV star Kim Kardashian referenced Sarah Bartman in her widely publicized Break the Internet nude photo shoot for Paper Magazine in the fall of 2014. Kardashian recreated an iconic 1976 photo that was laced and embedded with Sarah Bartman references. Critics felt that it showed a lack of respect for the indignities Bartman endured. Sarah's Bartman story is about centuries of trauma under colonialism. Various artists have created artworks to honor Sarah Bartman, to clothe her with dignity and give her an honorary place in South Africa's troubled history. At the opening of one of her shows, Lady Scully said, This show is dedicated to Sarah Bartman and the years she was stripped, put in jars, preserved and paraded against her will. Now my ass has become my Samson's mane. I draw strength from it. 
I revel in it. I take pictures and videos of it that I'll never share because what if I contribute to the oversexualization of the black female form? And that concludes the five artworks you need to know by this daring artist, Lady Scully. Lady Scully is an exciting and unapologetic artist who challenges society all the time. She aims to spark conversations about rape culture in South Africa through her politically charged paintings that reflect women's realities. Her art uniquely blends elements of fruit, humor, violence against women and her Khoisan heritage, addressing the impact of colonialism and apartheid on her culture. Lady Scully has not only received recognition as an artist, but has also become a fashion icon, merging urban colored street style with Khoisan influences. Her talent and creativity have led to collaborations with fashion brands like Woolworths. Notably, she was commissioned to design a commemorative coin for South Africa's 25th anniversary of democracy, portraying stylized Khoisan figures participating in their first vote. Lady Scully's art has gained critical acclaim both locally and internationally, earning her awards such as the FMB Art Prize. Her work has been showcased in renowned galleries, museums, and art fairs worldwide. Lady Scully's bold, Honest and unapologetic exploration of complex themes resonates with audiences and contributes to her growing recognition as an exceptional artist. I'm artist Lillian Gray and I love teaching art and art history. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and ring that bell so you never miss out on any of my new videos. This is a reminder that you can shop various worksheets for all ages online on our Teachers Pay Teachers website. Connect with us on social media and let us know what you thought of this video. Until next time.